Hello everyone, Dr. Data Science here. Welcome to Deep Dive into Keras. This is lecture one, where we talk about sequential API to implement a simple neural network model for the very famous exclusive OR or XOR example. So what is the sequential API? The sequential API in Keras is a stack of layers where you can simply add one layer at a time. And the information will flow through the first layer and will go to the next layer and so on until it reaches the last uh, layer of your network. And obviously in this case, each layer has weights that corresponds to the layer that follows it, right? So for example, here we have the weights that connect the, this input layer to the hidden layer, and also the weights that they go from the hidden layer to the output layer. And it's a very straightforward and simple way to build and train models. For more complex architectures, you probably want to look at the functional API in Keras. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a future video, but let's get started today uh, with the sequential API. So in order to implement neural network, in this case, you have to follow five steps. The very first step is to create an uh, object. So remember, uh, when you're working with Python, we work with object-oriented programming where we have classes. And once we instantiate a class, that's what we call an object. And in order to do that, you just simply from models, you import sequential. So this is a sequential a API. And then you instantiate this to create this model object. And once you do that, now you can add layers, right? Um, so one of the uh, you know layers that we work a lot with is this dense layer, which means that all the neurons are connected to the neurons in the previous layer. Um, that's why it's called the fully connected or dense layer. And you can do so very simply by just using this method called model.add. So this adds a layer to your network. And the thing that you really have to here specify is the number of units or the number of neurons in that layer. Uh, for the very first layer, you also, it's always a good idea to, to uh, give the dimension of your input data. For example, if you work with a two-dimensional data here, uh, the input dim would be two. And also the activation function or the nonlinear function that, that you use for, your, uh, for that layer. And here you can see that now we have also um, another layer um, that we are um, adding. Um, here, you know, we have units and activation. Here, you know, we don't define input dim anymore because we already know how many units we have before. So you don't need any more input dim here. And then for the very fast, uh, last layer, you can add model.add, uh, the number of units. And this really depends on the uh, data set that you have. If you have a binary classification, then you only use one unit here uh, with the sigmoid activation function. Um, and if you have like, let's say uh, a classification problem with 10 classes, then you use here units equals 10 and activation is equal to softmax. Uh, so to just to, to summarize this, your first and last layer are very much controlled by your data set, but you have um, a lot of freedom or flexibility in terms of what hidden layers you want to use. The next step, once you define or create your model, is to compile it. And this is where you provide the optimizer that you want to use. Remember, we are using gradient descent uh, type optimization techniques here. So we can say here, for example, SGD or uh, RMS prop or Adam or whatever else optimizer that you have. And we're going to talk about this in a future video. And then the loss function, and then the metrics that you want to use to 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 uh, monitor the learning progress. And once you do this, now you you do model feeding. So that's where you actually like train your model. You have to provide your training data, the number of epochs, or the number of times that you have to go through the data set, and the batch size, which means that um, how many data points are using uh, for each uh, gradient descent update. And once you uh, train your model. Now your model um, is trained, which means that now you can make predictions. So you can use model.predict. And um, now we're going to see how all these five steps work together to, to solve uh, a classification problem. So we're going to start by importing the essentials, meaning import NumPy as NP, 
uh, matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. This is what we need for plotting figures. Obviously, we are working with Keras. So you have to import TensorFlow as TF. Uh, and also from TensorFlow, we import Keras. Um, we can also look at the version of TensorFlow that you have. Currently, I have 2.1. Um, zero, right? So uh, I definitely recommend you to use uh, TensorFlow uh, 2.0. So in order to create the data set for this problem and in order uh, for you to be able to replicate these uh, experiments, and I also put a link down below for, for, the, for the GitHub page for these codes, uh, we're going to work with the synthetic data set. So we're going to work with uh, what is called as make blobs, as the name um, says, you're going to create blobs of data. I'm using np.random.seed to make sure that, um, you know, again, for reproducibility. And then I'm using make blobs where I provide four centers here. And each of these centers is a two-dimensional vector. Um, so you can see here that these are the four blobs that we create. The only thing I do here is that I want to make sure that this is a binary classification problem. Um, so I'm going to uh, convert those four labels that are created here uh, into a binary classification. I just assign them um, two different values. Um, and this is the exclusive OR problem that you can see in a lot of um, you know, neural networks and deep learning textbooks, that when you have zero and zero, you get zero, one and one, you get one. So this means, uh, sorry, one and one, you get zero. Uh, so this means that these two uh, clusters belong to the same class. And then when you have zero and one or one and zero, you get one. So that's the other class that we have. So that's why it's called exclusive or. Um, and other than that here, we're just using you know, scatter plot to, to plot the data with the colors as the labels uh, and we're using the title, um, X and Y labels. That's always a good practice to, to follow. But the point that really uh, is important here is, is to you know um, create the model, you know um, compile it and train it. Uh, in order to do that, we you know as we said, use Keras that models import sequential. So that's for the sequential API, and then you import the dense layer. You instantiate your um, object here, this model object. You add your first uh, hidden layer, which has two units in it. And I'm using here exponential linear unit as my activation. And I'm going to say that the input dimension here is two, right? So if I go back to this very first uh, figure that we have here, you can see that this is a two dimensional problem. So these are the two inputs that I have. And these are the two units that I have in my uh, single hidden layer in this uh, problem. So therefore we have four rates and also we have two biases. And remember, we always have biases uh, unless if we, we turn off that option, but for now we have these biases. So it's a total of six parameters that we have to learn, four weights and two biases. And then going from hidden layer to the output, there are two weights and one bias that goes to the output layer. Okay, so now uh, one thing that you can do, so once you define your model and you compile it, so here I'm using a stochastic gradient descent and because it's a classification problem, I'm using binary cross entropy. Um, so now you can use model.summary. So this is exactly what I was talking about, that you can see that we have six parameters that we have to train uh, for the first layer and then three for the second one, right? Uh, so this is including biases that we have to include. Then you can look at uh, model.layers. So this, this gives you some attributes or whatever layers that we have. And you can see that if I look at the first layer, that's why it's index zero, and use this method get weights, you can see that we have a two by two weight matrix and two biases. Um, and even though we have not trained anything right now, um, you can see that there are still values here because we initialize these you know, usually randomly. Um, and so you can see that the weight matrix has you know, some random numbers here. Um, and then the biases are usually initialized by, by zeros. Um, you can see that here too, for the next layer, we have a, um, you know, a, a, a two weights um, that takes us from the hidden layer to the output layer and then the bias term. But the point that you start to train this model is when you use this model that fit, where you provide your data, both the inputs and the labels, the number of epochs, which I have here choose 10, and the batch size, which I have chosen to be four. So these are uh, options that you have to provide in, in general. So you can see that based on what we have here, 
uh, printed. We have epoch one, two, up to 10. Uh, the last function is what you try to minimize. So that's what's, um, you know, usually you hope that it will be uh, descending or, or a decreasing function as, as, as the number of epochs increases. And the accuracy here is classification accuracy. So you want that to be as close as to be to one. And you can see that it is, you know, at the end, um, 0.99, so very close to one. So we can actually look at the accuracy and loss as the as a function of number of epochs because this is the information stored in that history um, object that we have here, and this gives us um, a, a lot of good information, right? So if you look at it, let's look at um, you know accuracy first. So you can see that accuracy is increasing. So we are starting, uh, you know, from you know point. Uh, if I don't make a mistake here, from point five, which means that you uh, flip a coin and you get, you know, 50% um, classification accuracy. Um, and then uh, as we have more epochs, you can see that this gets closer and closer to one or 100%. And, and then we see consistent results with the loss function, right? The loss function, uh, you know, decreases consistently as the number of epochs increases. So this is a perfect scenario of uh, a neural network model that works um, that works well for a given problem. And this is what we expect because of the uh, synthetic data set that we have. And now after you train your model, you can again look at those weights for the first layer. And if you look at it, these are different um, than uh, what we had before because you know we trained this model. And the same thing with biases, you can see that now we actually have non-zero values for, for these bias terms. The last thing we want to, to talk about here is how you can visualize your classifier and have that nice plot of the probabilities that we just saw. In order to do that, you have to first create a two-dimensional grid. So you provide the mean and max values for both uh, X and Y axes, um, some step size, and then use this np.mesh grid. Um, and this, what basically does is that gives you all the coordinates that you need to create a, a two-dimensional grid. And now you can just ravel them, meaning that you flatten them and you concatenate them to create this mesh underscore input uh, where you have these two-dimensional data points or coordinates for uh, all the sort of like, you know, data points on your grid. And then you use model.predict. And in this case, this gives you the probability that your data point belongs to uh, class uh, one. So that's what we get here with predictions. Uh, and then we, we fit this to the contour plot, right? So this plt.contourf, um, that's what gives you this really nice plot, right? So these are the probabilities that we get here. So you can see that obviously the separation here, that this middle street is one class. And then when you get farther from both sides, then it is more and more likely that you belong to the other class, the data points that you have. Um, so that's why here you can see that this neural network uh, is successful at uh, predicting these classes correctly, even though this is a complex problem because a linear classifier cannot correctly, you know, classify all these data points. So this was uh, one of the first examples of neural networks to show that, um, you know, um, that they work very well with these types of uh, problems with subclusters. And as a very final note, um, to just uh, you know, again, corroborate the fact that if you use model.predict in, in Keras, you get probabilities. Um, I'm going to plot a histogram of these values, and you can see that they're from zero to one, right? So as we said, these are probability scores, uh, and you can see that, um, you know, uh, for, you know, about like 10,000 um, sort of like cases or so, um, here we have um, probabilities very close to zero, and then probabilities very close to one. Um, similarly, and then a few data points that we are very close to like 50%, right? So these are the, you know, more difficult cases to, to predict. Thank you so much for watching this video.